as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the glory and the power. If you would please stand with me for the reading of God's word. Sermon lesson this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow, so that it builds itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. God in heaven, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you that in Paul's words here, who have given us access to eternal truth, Lord, we ask that by your spirit, we would come to know you more this morning, that our hearts might be plowed and tilled for your gospel to take root. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Be seated. Last week, we heard Paul's prayer for power and strengthening in the Holy Spirit to welcome Christ into the Ephesians' hearts, exposing their sin and darkness, power and strengthening to comprehend the mystery of Christ proclaimed in the unity and the diversity of the church and praise for the power that works within them. That prayer ended the first half of Ephesians, the end of chapter 3, and that's understood as Paul writing about the indicatives of the Christian life. The indicatives meaning those things which are true about the church as Christ's body on earth. That's why we have had extended reflection on the Trinity, on the power of God, on his authority and the importance of the ascension of Christ. We've seen Ephesians showing the gospel as lofty and expansive and yet eminently accessible, holy above and set apart and yet intimately experienced. The doctrine that we've been going through is not sterile or stuffy, but it is warm. It's encouraging. It's full of hope. And today we begin the second half of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And Paul says, therefore, now in light of all the stuff that he's written about before, all those truths that he had written to them about, he begins making things a little more practical as he expounds what are called the imperatives of the Christian life. That is, the things for which we are responsible for as a result of our union with Christ. The things that we must do as God's adopted sons and daughters, the way we must live. So let's dive in this morning and we'll see what God has for us in this portion of scripture under three different headings, living up, building up, and growing up. First up this morning, Paul calls the Ephesians 
to live up to their calling. He continues to use the walking metaphor as he encourages them to walk in a manner worthy. They've been given a calling in eternity past, he said. They were called in due time when the Lord saved them. And now they are expected to live up to that calling. Now, when we hear those words, live up, as I am putting them here, we might think of living up to something like meriting some type of benefit that you've been given. We may have been given something desirable, and now we have to prove, as it were, that we are worthy of that gift. But that kind of takes us back to our discussion about gifts in the previous weeks. The Christ gift, as we have said, is a completely gratuitous bestowal of the Spirit by God himself to subjects who are completely unfitting recipients. That's what Paul's told us so far. God's grace is incongruous. It doesn't fit with our notions of worth and value. But Paul is pointing at something different here this morning. He's not encouraging merit as if God saved them and now they've got to do their part to stay saved. That's not how salvation works. True believers can never lose their salvation. If they could, that would introduce a whole host of problems to the theology we find in the Bible. But Paul is pointing to the reality that our character must change once Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. And he points to three different traits of a changed heart. Humility, gentleness, and patience. Humility is showing deferential honor to others, regardless of their social class, rank, age, gender, ethnicity, culture, so on and so forth. But it's not putting yourself down. C.S. Lewis once famously wrote, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. And the ancients despised this. So this would have been radical for the Ephesians. Gentleness is a quality of not being overly impressed with one's sense of self-importance. In other words, it's a spirit-wrought self-control and kindness, working together to calm the impulsive, to calm the abrasive. And it works with the last trait really well, which is patience. Patience itself being remaining tranquil while awaiting an outcome or bearing up under trial being steadfast. It's self-control in the face of provocation. Paul is telling the Ephesians here that they should live up to these things. To be called by Christ is to be challenged. It was a challenge to the Ephesians because their culture told them that humility was a bad thing. And gentleness and patience weren't exactly very practical and still aren't today, right? It's a challenge for us as well. You know, we always are told that self-promotion is the key. Our identity as individuals is the primary driver of our actions. To someone in a world of competition, of survival of the fittest, we must look out for ourselves. We can't be burdened with thinking of other people more than ourselves. We have to survive. And to do that, we have to put ourselves above other people. If I show repentance and seek forgiveness when I've sinned against someone, I might appear weak. I might be foolish. People might think I'm childish or that I don't have it all together. I've got to show them that it's not my problem. I've got my stuff together. I've got my act together. If I showed self-control and kindness to someone who has offended me, then they might think that they can walk all over me the next time. I can't allow them to do that. I can't be a doormat. I need to be strong. I need to be aggressive so I can put them in their place. If I slow down in this relationship to understand the hurt, to enter into someone else's pain, then all the other things I need to do are going to get put off. Or I may even have more to do whenever I enter into this pain. I might have to reschedule other things just to meet these needs or to begin a healing process. I just, 
I need to cut this off right now. I just need to move on. Why does Paul choose these traits? It's because being called into a body of people from different places on the social, economic, racial, ethnic grid will inevitably make us irritated at times. We will rub up against people that don't jive with us. We'll be irritated, that is, if we assume that everyone else in the church should think and act and speak like we do. Irritated if we sinfully want everyone in the church to think, act, and speak like we do. We're so individualistic in our culture and yet still want everyone to be like us. It's so weird. If we assume the church should think, act, and speak like we do, then we're in danger of spiritually homogenizing the bride of Christ, disenfranchising others for whom Christ died, others to whom he is joined in the Spirit. It's the equivalent of saying, if you think about it this way, thanks for saving me, Jesus. It's such a good idea that I'm here. Now, here is a... These are the people that you're allowed to bring into this church, right? What might it look like, though, if we were to welcome other people into the church knowing that our humility will be challenged when we're rebuked for sin. It might be tempting to deflect or to blame shift or to justify our actions after the fact. Or if you hear someone say something that doesn't quite jive with your theology, maybe show off our Bible chops a little bit, right? What might it look like if we were to welcome other people into the church knowing that gentleness would be a challenge for us? That our well-intended acts of service actually offended someone else? It can be tempting to write someone off, someone else that is, right, as petty or childish. They just don't understand. I was trying to help. Or what if you've been called out because you've sinned against someone else? It could be quite tempting to bulldoze over someone else's concerns. What might it look like if you were to welcome others into the church knowing that your patience will be challenged? As spiritually messy people come in and they cling to you, it could be tempting to just want to solve their problems for them right away. Or it could be tempting to withhold good from them instead of sitting with them, being present with them walking with them through it. Maybe your children or family are in a difficult season right now and they seem to get on your last nerve. It could be tempting to avoid their needs because we don't think we can deal with it right now. How do we fight against this individualism? Verse 3 says that we must be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We are to hasten to guard the unity of the Spirit. We're not to be individuals doing our own thing. We are each possessors and partakers of the Spirit of God together. But Paul continues this morning. He says that not only do we need to live up to our calling, but we need to be built up. And he uses a familiar metaphor of the human body. We've already had this before. As a body is built up over time, it comes into maturity. For the body of Christ to be built up, Paul says that Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. And it's naturally interesting here to want to know about these different offices that he mentions, but that's not Paul's focus. So we're not going to talk about it. Paul isn't interested in discussing what makes each of these positions unique, as we might be, or even who might fit into these categories. He is rather focused on the speech of the church. God has chosen to build up his one body on earth, the church, through the speaking and teaching of Holy Scripture. The foolishness of preaching, as Paul says elsewhere. 
through Scripture, listening to the proclamation of the gospel, being taught by the shepherds of the church, through God's word, spoken through finite men, God chooses to bring his body to maturity, to equip or train God's people for God's mission, to make disciples of all people. What a crazy idea. But this is also a challenge for us. It challenged the Ephesians. There are not only the pastors and Sunday school teachers, not only small group leaders and Bible study teachers and the family members we interact with around the Scripture, but today we have this thing called the Internet. And it's really interesting if you've never checked it out. But, um, you know, all that to say, if we hear something that strikes our fancy or something that's interesting, we have only to enter a few terms into a search bar and whoosh, we get all this information thrown at us. We have a flood of information at our fingertips to be surfed and sorted and sifted into different categories for our own use. It's really amazing. It's a gift. At no other time in history could people ever imagine this. But with that flood of information comes competing voices. Voices that compete with Holy Scripture. The things we read when not filtered through what we know in the Bible to be true actually tears down God's body. If the church doesn't sustain itself with a proper diet of truth, then the church can't be built up and it can't grow. For instance, when the world tells us that a human child in the womb is simply a product and thus what we decide to do with that human being with another human life is immaterial. When unpopular beliefs contradict the truth of God's word like love is love and we should be allowed to marry who we want. When the popular belief is that men and women can choose a different state of being than what they were born with and so what we think or feel is more determinative than how we're created. The danger for the church comes when its pastors and shepherds and teachers buy into a different story than what the Bible tells. The danger for us is when we buy into a different story. Instead of holding fast to the teaching of Scripture, handed down through the apostles and the prophets, which the church itself is built upon, Jesus Christ being the cornerstone, they become enamored more with the progress of the world than the enduring truth that they've been called to preach. There's continual pressure on the church as you know, to conform to the world, to move the dial from what's always been taught and believed because cultural winds have changed. The teachings of Scripture become unpopular. They're untenable for us to hold on to if you're trying to make your own way in the world, if you want to impress or win or be relevant. How do we combat this shift in the church? The church can only be built up by listening to the correct voice. Which voice is that? God's voice. Speaking through the pages of Scripture. Proclaimed faithfully in our churches. Taught faithfully from house to house in community. It involves personal study and reflection as we hear the gospel on Sunday mornings and then we perceive the insight like Paul wrote about in chapter 3. Not only hearing the preaching of God's word, but studying privately, talking in small groups, meeting to study together, like the Bereans in Acts, seeing if these things were true according to the scriptures. Hearing the word and then digesting it through further reflection and testing. At Emmanuel, if I or Greg or anyone else were to proclaim a gospel which doesn't agree with Scripture, then let us be accursed. The danger for preachers and pastors and elders and church leaders, indeed the entire congregation of God's people, is not waking up and suddenly changing their stance. But the greatest danger might be being silent when the truth of God's Word is challenged. It's neglecting to stand firm under pressure. 
It's speech that is sweet. We must be wise in our consumption, in the voices that we listen to. And this is challenging because we have different lives and jobs and families, right? We don't all have time to go become Bible scholars, preachers, pastors, that kind of thing. But the Lord has gifted the church with many faithful voices throughout history. Many faithful men and women throughout history have spent their lives on the edification of God's bride. We might disagree with some, but if the truth of the gospel is taught, friends, then we should be able as mature readers to see truth where it is and to change accordingly. The fact is, according to this text, that we are not the mature Christians that we think we are. We are called to be built up continually through a steady diet of apostolic witness, preaching and teaching that proclaims the mystery of Christ crucified for us through hearing the right voices. And when we do that as a church, we will grow into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, Paul says. Which brings us to our final point this morning, and that's growing up. Paul called the Ephesians to live up to their calling, be built up with sound teaching, and now he calls them to grow together into a healthy body. You ever tell someone, grow up, or don't be a baby? You ever said that to anybody? Did that help? Um, it hasn't been very helpful any time I've said it. But uh, Paul here is gently, theologically, telling the Ephesians that they need to grow up. He didn't hammer them and say, man, you Ephesians, you have no idea how to be a church. I can't believe you all. Get your act together. Pull yourselves up by your bootstraps. Stop being theological babies. Paul didn't say all that. Instead, he exhorted them to growth through the faithful speaking ministry of the church. He pointed them to the means by which they could be brought to Christian maturity and thereby grow up into their head, Jesus Christ. We are all, Paul says, joints and body parts and ligaments, tendons and muscles, and we're all growing into our exalted head. And when each one of us is functioning properly, according to our calling, we actually build each other up in love. But when are we supposed to speak? Uh, how are we supposed to do this? How do we get this measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? Paul says that it's by speaking the truth in love. When are we supposed to do this? What does it look like practically? The short answers are always and depends. We have been given a calling, you see, that we must live up to, being built up through the teaching we hear Sundays in our community groups and so forth. In short, through Christian discipleship, we are to be brought together increasingly as Jesus' church continues to grow in the world. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. It's discipleship through relationships in the church, through hearing the preaching of God's Word, through the teaching of the Word, through examining the Scriptures to be sure if what we're being taught is accurate and true, and thereby how we treat others, how we handle conflict and division, how we live our lives should be different than what the world and the devil and the flesh tell us, friends being fully convinced of the better story that Scripture tells us. If this is how we're living, together in humble community, journeying with each other in patient discipleship, building healthy habits of worship, leading lives of holiness, then we will inevitably be drawn in and grow into Jesus Christ. We will become more self-sustaining, more life-giving people we will become more magnetic to the community 
and become a more magnetic, life-giving church. We will become the gospel together and for the life of the world as we walk worthy of our calling, a calling we received in eternity and looks forward to eternity. What might this look like practically, though? Speaking the truth in love, after all, it does demand a lot of us. We must align our words and our hearts with what Scripture teaches. We should desire to be led to and to lead others to Jesus. Distorted doctrine, trickery, and error, they're all weapons to build up self, to support and sustain factions, to promote a different gospel than the one that we hear about in the pages of Scripture. The importance should not be lost on us. Our words, friends, are powerful. Speaking truthfully should not divide the household of God. Rather, it should unite us. Discipleship feeds church growth. Church growth is biblical. Not simply to increase revenue or reach, but to increase God's rule. Not only to offer a wide reach, but to plant deeper roots. Not simply to commodify church growth through best business practices, but to liberally dispense the kingdom of God into the lives of everyone around us. And as we speak the truth in love, the body will be healed. The sick parts will get better. The broken parts will be bound up. Captives set free, relational distances will be closed as together we humbly submit to one another in love. In gentleness, we will approach our brothers and sisters who've wronged us or who we've wronged. As together we repent and we give and receive forgiveness. In patience, we will bear with our brothers and sisters in difficulty and trial and suffering as together we endure it together. Why? It's because speaking truthfully will not allow sin to remain. But love will dictate that we confront it in our own hearts privately and in our church corporately. Speaking the truth will not require hastily cauterizing the wounds, but love will require that we gently and graciously persevere with one another. Speaking the truth will not mean crushing one another with reminders of our failures and our brokenness. But love will require exhortation to lives of holiness and point us to the promise of our sanctification. Speaking the truth will not require theological arrogance, but love will require humble enduring. This kind of growth that Paul's talking about, this organic whole food type spirituality is God's prescription to nourish his body and make each part when working properly cause all of its other constituent parts to flourish. What are some of the takeaways that we have this morning? What might we need to latch on to in order for the Lord to transform us by his spirit into fit vessels for his use? as we grow into Christ. First, we must work at unity. We must labor strenuously to guard the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And that means striving for peace at EPC and within the broader church. Humility, not arrogance. Gentleness, not aggressiveness. Patience, not hastiness. What might this look like? It means that members of the church must be repentant and not reactionary. The church must be calm, not corrosive. The church must esteem one another, not explode at one another. Why? The reason is because we're one in Christ. Not one day united to him and each other, okay? 
our unity in Christ is a now reality. Not sometime in the future hope for dream. We are all, every believer, spiritually united by the Spirit in Christ presently. In light of that unity, then, what kind of lives ought we to live in personal and communal holiness? Two, we have to embrace humility. Paul was a prisoner. So we see that walking worthy looks like taking the road less traveled. Not the road of rugged individualism like our society says. Living up actually means looking out for everyone else's well-being in our church and in the community, in our community groups, in our Bible studies, in our homes. And when that happens, we will begin to see that spirit-wrought organic growth in the body that we talked about. And three, we should pour back into our church, using our time and our talents, our resources to build each other up. And when that happens, we will begin to literally pour out to others outside the church. It will be so natural and second nature to us to live up to our calling in humility and gentleness and patience that our lives will overflow into the neighborhoods around us, here in Cedar Park and beyond, wherever you live. As we speak the truth in love, the stress fractures within our walls begin to be mended. Wounds will be healed. Relational repair will be a priority as we repent of sin, seek and receive forgiveness from one another. And with all that will come a greater awareness of how we might need to repent toward people outside our walls, maybe. But where does it all come from? These are some good things to do, right? Where is our model for gospel living? You know, Jesus reserved his harshest criticism for religious elites. Those people in Judea who thought they had it all down, who chased prestige and they liked greetings in the marketplace and they liked to sit at the head of the table. They liked to point out your failures. They liked to load you down with heavy burdens. Jesus spoke the truth in love to those people, but firmly even rebuking them publicly, not to crush them and leave them hopeless, but to bring them to repentance. With sinners, Jesus took a bit different tack. Jesus was compassionate and he was gentle. He would dine with them. He would attend their parties. He would forgive them. He spoke the truth and love to them drawing them toward the hope of the gospel. That, is, that in him, their sins could be forgiven and their guilt taken away. Even in agony and abandonment on the cross, Jesus showed mercy to a thief who hung next to him. As he, lay, as he hung there, bleeding, suffocating, dying for you. That same ascended, powerful Christ that we've encountered in Ephesians over and over again, it's the same Jesus who descended to the earth so that he might be among us, his incarnation. As Paul wrote in verses 9 through 10, in saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended to the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who ascended far above into the heavens, that he might fill all things. Why did he do it? Verse 7 and 8 told us, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. You remember Moses climbing Sinai, receiving the commandments of God, and then descending the mountain to give that gift of God's law to his people? Jesus condescended to us and then whenever he ascended back, the truth of the gospel, his incarnation, his substitutionary death, and his resurrection and the future restoration, friends, he gave all that to the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to teach and to build up his church. 
to each member of his body he gave a measure of himself as a gift. It's not like somebody in the church who's more holy or seems more holy or knows more, they don't have more of the Spirit than you do. God has given each believer the gift of himself in full. Full stop. And that's where we get real unity in the body, friends. It's when we realize that we already possess that unity. That all those characteristics will begin to come out. It's when we embrace the reality of this unity that we are more fully empowered to live up to the calling that we have, walking worthy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not because we have the skills or because we were already cool enough or we already had everything we needed to do it. No. It's because we had nothing to commend ourselves to God that he spent his most precious resource so that he might have us all and call us his treasure and give us his inheritance because he was delighted to do so. It was only because of his love for us that he bled and died for our redemption. Only his love for us that he was raised to life again, defeating death and sin and the devil permanently, once for all. This is the truth of the gospel. God's lavish love for sinners. Repent and believe this truth. Walking worthy in love. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that in Jesus, our risen and ascended Lord, we have access to come to you boldly. We ask that in every interaction, in every relationship, every situation, that you would transform our hearts and minds and actions to be more like Jesus, speaking the truth in love through the power of your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.